Welcome to Understanding the Marijuana Movement Pot Watch. I'm Heidi Heilman from the Massachusetts Prevention Alliance, and I'm very excited about our show today. I'm with my co-host Jody Hensley from Westboro, and we are joined by a very special guest from Colorado, Joe McGuire. Good morning. Good morning. We're so glad you could be here today. Joe is an expert in workplace issues. She knows all about the details and intricacies of putting in place marijuana legislation um, under a government protected industry in, in Colorado because that's where they are they are right now and we are facing a very important in, um, a, a very important ballot question ballot question four which is the question that would legalize marijuana here and commercialize and commercialize mm -hmm. marijuana here in Massachusetts recreation for recreational use now we already have medical marijuana that has passed we also have decriminalized um, law that has decriminalized marijuana. So now we're talking about full recreational legalization and we have many, many questions to ask you. Um, and so I think it would be great to start with workplace issues. Sure. What, what do you think? Yeah, I think workplace issues, I think clarifying what uh, the law means and what it has meant for Colorado is important. Yep. And I think clarifying that this is a law that will legalize and commercialize marijuana and much more potent forms of the drug as well as marijuana concentrates and uh, introduce THC into the food system in Massachusetts. Right. So those are the pieces we'd like to hear some details yeah, and, about. And, and before we start the, um, with, with what your experience is, maybe we should frame it around, you know, this is 24 pages of prescriptive law that we will be voting on on November 8th. And so there are very detailed pieces in there. And, and the ones that are, you know, ones that are big, I mean, are the, the home growing, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about some of the um, pieces around uh, what, what it authorizes with the THC products that are gonna be sold, how many pot shops. So that would be good. Why don't we start with the questions that you had prepared yeah. for this? Mm -hmm. Let's start great. with employers because mm -hmm. uh, Mary Jo, tell us a little bit about what you do now in Colorado since uh, legalization has Absolutely. happened and the impact on employment and employers. You bet. Well, when, when Colorado legalized marijuana in 2012, I was actually involved in workplace drug and alcohol testing. And a lot of what I did was encompassed in the rules for Department of Transportation. So they have mandated drug and alcohol testing for safety sensitive employees. So your pilots and railroad engineers and um, over the road truck drivers, which makes sense and we all are happy about that no matter who you are, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that was my area of expertise. And then I was asked to serve on Governor Hickenlooper's task force work group for regulation under banking, taxation, and civil law, civil law being the employment piece. And we had a strong employer's rights statement in Colorado, and we weren't super worried about it. You have almost the identical language. There are a few little changes. But the main things in your law that look the same as ours are that employers can restrict the use of marijuana in the workplace. And what I came to discover when we legalized in Colorado was that the attorneys representing the marijuana lobby who were equally represented in the work group said, wait a minute, we used that word restrict intentionally because it means to limit, not prohibit. That was quite shocking. We, we did not understand that th there was a difference in the meaning. So what I've seen happen, and, and since that time, I've now gone out and I, full time, I talk to employers full time. And so I have my own company and I spend a lot of time talking about their policies, about their position descriptions, because they have the right to limit but not necessarily prohibit. So what are the results hmm. in your drug, if you're in, in your drug screening in the workplace, what are some of the results I'll you've tell seen? You, it's been amazing. In year one, so we, we passed the law in November 2012. In 2013, the very first year, and remember, retail stores didn't open for another year. This was just personal use. Uh, we saw positive THC drug tests in the workplace go from the national average of 6% to a whopping 20% in Colorado. The state of Washington is 23%. More than triple. Wow. It more than more triple than positive in THC the very first tests. Year. How does that compare with the national average? 6%. And we were at, the, we were at that national average prior. So the national average is 6% and mm -hmm. now Colorado's, Colorado's at 20%. 20%. Washington's at 23%. 23%. And I want to go back because I want to make sure our, our viewers get this clear. There's prescriptive language in our ballot mm -hmm. that allows employers to restrict as opposed to prohibit. Absolutely. So correct. they would not be allowed, if this passes, to just blanket say we have a no tolerance policy. If you if, if you are tested p positive, we have 
the uh, right to to um, terminate. So let's clarify. It comes down to how the law is enforced, and that's where the regulatory scheme gets tricky. Okay. Because it depends on what the marijuana lobby is willing to sue over. Right now, we have almost 30 cases pending in Colorado courts. Colorado protects employers' rights at this point in time. I mean, we ruled in favor of, of Dish Network in the Coates case. Uh, if you know what that is, that was under medical marijuana, where okay. it was a medical marijuana patient, um, very sympathetic patient, had MS, worked at home, used medical marijuana. He, he says the company knew. The company did random drug testing. He failed. They fired him, so he sued appealed mm -hmm. up to the state Supreme Court and in Colorado I mean it was mm -hmm. a, a decision that was two to one mm -hmm. but um, he was able he was a dish network one and he lost his job so we have protected employers however what the folks at the table attorney Kimberly Ryan specifically who wrote a minority report that said everywhere in Colorado law that doesn't agree with the employee's constitutional right in our state to use marijuana, the law should be changed to agree with, the, with marijuana reform because the employee's right to use marijuana is greater than the employer's right to drug test. So and that's so the issue that's in the play issue. now. Yes. That's and it's shifting. never been completely resolved? There's lots of litigation lots around Lots of litigation. That. So an employer okay. needs to be prepared. They need to know how to write their policies. They need to know how to enforce them. They need to know what is one cases in the past. Okay. They need to know what is safety sensitive and what is not. So there's a lot of issues there, but the bottom line that, that I want employers to understand, especially here, is with the new products, the higher concentrates, the higher potencies. We're not talking about an employee who stays at home Friday night in his basement, gets high, doesn't bother me because Monday morning he's fine. We're talking about impairment that can last for days with concentrates, with edibles. And so employers need to understand what to look for. They need to recognize signs and symptoms because it's not what you think. It's not old school pot. So can we break that down a little bit? In the 60s, 70s, even the 80s, we had a cannabis plant with THC levels from 2%, 2 to 3%. 3, 3, 4%. Right. The really, really good stuff was 5 Okay, yeah. what's you know? happening with the modified plants in Colorado now? Listen, you talk about GMOs. Um, not only are we seeing the plant itself that is being altered to have extremely high THC potency, and, which in the in naturally occurring plant mm -hmm. about 15 to 20 percent, right, right. but now with extracts, butane hash oil extractions, um, they're spraying the concentrate on the loose leaf, but then you have edibles, you have um, vape cartridges that go in the e-cigarettes right. and, and, and all of these other products that we have now. We have THC potencies that in 2013 were at 40 and 50 percent. We thought that was really incredible. Okay. Now they're at 90 and 95 percent. So okay. you're, there, you're telling me that they're extracting the THC from a plant and then spraying it on the raw material that people put into a joint exactly. or into a bong, and now there are also these enhance. other delivery systems that yeah. are the e-cigarettes, the mm -hmm. vape pens, mm -hmm. the the, the, the stuff they light on fire that's, you know. Exactly, and, and those things don't necessarily come with the smell that you associate right. with right. traditional marijuana. Right. So it can be undetected right under your nose. So, so. we're wow. in completely new wow. territory right. in yeah. terms of workplace impacts because right. this is uh, not marijuana. It is now brand new drugs of, right. that are much more potent that are THC based and right. I've had to learn this whole new language mm -hmm. right. into uh, right. butane hash oils mm -hmm. and formulations of concentrates called wax and dabs and shatters Correct. which are either ingested through food or mm -hmm. inhaled right. through all kinds of other mm -hmm. devices. Right. So we're really dealing with a new hard drug. Right. I happen to know that in drug policy in Europe uh, it, the, the Netherlands which 80% of the communities do not allow these semi-legal um, coffee shops. Mm -hmm. They've been fighting to set potency levels for THC at 15 percent, above which they consider it a hard drug. Right. Mm -hmm. So what you're telling me is in Colorado, a version of hard drugs are now freely traded. Absolutely, and all completely legal because our law as well as yours allows for 100 percent THC. I say if you are putting in something that is a true tax and regulate, you don't allow unlimited. Unlimited so, potencies. Unlimited potencies. So it, it's not only, hmm. I mean, you have these unlimited potencies and people don't understand the potencies. So right. they think 
Colorado's done a really great job at regulating this because they set a serving size. Okay, well, we guessed at a serving size, but that does not encapsulate the potency. Right. Okay. So, yes, you can have 10 milligrams in a serving of an edible, but is it 20%, 30%, 60%, 80%? So what you're telling me is you could have raw plants that's at 5% THC, 10% THC, 15% THC or higher, mm -hmm. and you can possess up to an ounce of that. Mm -hmm. But you can, how much of a 90% concentrate can you possess? It does, mm -hmm. unlimited. I, I hear you so saying that. So the, the psychoactive drug is, it's really an unlimited right. level. So what do you tell um, mm -hmm. employers now? When you, they can't prohibit it, they can't say we have a no tolerance policy. What's your base, well, what's your base recommendation for employers at this time? That's a good question. Uh, right now, zero tolerance is allowable, but if you don't enforce your policy consistently, and if you don't make your employees aware of it, you open yourself up for litigation. For okay. The industry, the marijuana industry, or the cannabis attorneys say that you should be able to prove that your employee is in a safety sensitive position. Mm -hmm. Really what you need to do is to be able to articulate whether or not each position in your company can operate under the influence. Okay. So put that in your policy, put it in your position descriptions, and be prepared. You, employers really not need to start thinking who can be under the influence at work and who cannot. Tell, wow. me, tell me what is at, um, at stake for the employer. What is at stake for the employer if they have impaired employees? Ultimately, employees who use marijuana have 55% more accidents, 85% more injuries, 55% more absenteeism, less productivity. You're talking about work comp claims, you know, losing. A small business can lose up to $7,000 per month from any illicit drug use. Because of lost productivity. Lost, pro oh. lost productivity, okay. um, job turnover. Absenteeism. Absenteeism, okay. you know, all of these oh, things. Sense. But the accidents and injuries. You have a small business owner who gets a work comp claim that's fairly serious. It can shut them it's down. Shut them down. Ultimately. Yep. What that about liability? Sense. Can you talk to me about liability? Well, one of the things that I really am concerned about is that in your law, you have a piece that says... Um, it talks about proving professional negligence or, mm -hmm. or malpractice. So how do you prove that? If you have to prove that your employee was negligent and you knowingly allowed them to work in a negligent state, doesn't that set the employer up for some liability mm -hmm. and, and some culpability? Culpability. So, wow. you know, it's really mm -hmm. tricky. That's something that we did not have in mm -hmm. our law but I've seen Arizona is putting this into play. I'm seeing Massachusetts put this into play. That's very concerning. Okay. Can okay. the employer now be set up for a tort because they allow, if you prove an employee worked mm -hmm. negligently, then you're responsible for allowing so that So it's negligence. a bit like the social host liability if someone drives away from your home impaired exactly. and gets in an accident, you, you could are, be you, it, you, you can be responsible. Right. So now employees that. might be wow. placed in that same bind. Right. If you have an employee who is injured or there's an accident, Absolutely. the employee and, may be liable. Right, and right out of the gate, I saw employers who wanted to um, increase the cutoff levels in their drug testing to allow for some to be in the system because, hey, it's legal, we should yeah. make allowances. Well, you're not a, a forensic toxicologist. You're not a scientist when you're you know, making widgets in the workplace. What do you know about those cutoff levels and what they mean? I mean these things took decades for SAMHSA to put into place. So you allow some in your system and then you have an employee out there that gets hurt or hurts someone, why would they not be able to come back to you and say, but you said this was okay? So I think that's a dangerous practice. I think employers really need to think that through to mm -hmm. the end. Go through the what-if scenarios mm -hmm. and, and make sure you play that out and get help from an expert because it's really tough to do that on your own when you don't know a lot about what's coming. It's not just a little pot. Well, let's talk about it's not just a little pot because in our law, in the details in our law, I know that um, it would allow not only pot retail shops, but people would be able to grow up to 12 plants in their home. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I do understand that in Colorado, Colorado's law only allows six plants per household. Per adults. Per adults. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so how, how does that play out in Colorado? I and mean, what is that done with these home grows where people can grow 12 plants in their home? Right. We're So what we're seeing, and, and so many of us did, just did not know a lot about this. Now we're learning all these things, but um, through science, um, home growers have learned how to get a harvest about every 90 days. From one plant, From every 90 days. Every, every 90 days. Right. So a healthy marijuana plant can 
produce about a pound of pot per grow season. So if it, which is every 90 days. Every 90 days. They can get a pound of pot. So, so what's if, the potential in this home grow? So if two adults have their six plants each, 12 plants, four growing seasons per year, a pound of pot per plant, that's 48 pounds per home. Okay, so that and that is uninspected, unregulated, non-organic can they be can chemically be. intensive and that kind of a supply can be produced in uh, under our law in any household in, in any, Massachusetts. In any household. So, so what what's, that, what's that doing to the black market? I'll tell you, that is the black market. We So when you talk about tax and regulate, but you allow home grows, you completely undercut, first of all, your whole taxation scheme. Oh, wow. So you've really shot yourself in the That's foot. That's right. right. Okay. So <laughs> Completely undercut your taxation scheme. And then you allow okay. the home grows. And one of the particular things that's interesting, and I found it in your question today. Thanks for looking. Is yeah. it, thank you. Is that... Um, you're allowed personal under personal use rules you're allowed to gift up to one ounce for free and and what it says is without remuneration so what we're seeing people do is I'm going to drive this product out to your location and and gift it to you for free up to one ounce how much is one ounce well it, it just depends on the market but it, uh, I mean, it, it could it be do? 60 oh. joints 60, 60 joints. so it, is that raw plant, plant or can it be an ounce of concentrate it can be an ounce of concentrate so an ounce of well. concentrate wow. at THC so I mean let me, we can do a lot of math um, right right to go from 15 to 20 percent THC raw plant to 90 percent concentrate right. and you so can in, give away an ounce of either right of those. so in okay. raw plant it could be 60 joints and in a concentrate of an oil it could be 800 servings it could be I mean and 800, you can gift servings? 800 servings right. in an ounce of concentrate right. wow. so what folks are doing is saying I will drive this out to you and gift it to you and then you donate to me hundred and fifty dollars for my gas and my time so we have just perpetuated the black market and, and spread 40, access in every community. Absolutely. 45% oh, okay. of our kids say, I obtain my marijuana legally in Colorado. So when we say you're going to keep it out of the hands of kids, we have just absolutely opened up. I mean, 24% so say they get it from their parents. And that's. Uh, I want to talk about kids. Is that yeah, okay? Let's, let's please talk about because, kids. But let's talk yep. about how are they getting it legally? How does that work? But a say. friend who obtains it legally, either out of oh, a retail okay. store or they have their medical marijuana card or the home grow. Or the home grow. Okay. And I want to point out that if marijuana is in the hands of someone under 21 years of age, it is illegal and it is black market That's what, marijuana. That's you said kids. And That's the stuff that the mm -hmm, stuff yeah. that is coming out of home grows has no certification, no inspection, no. so you don't know what you're getting. That's right. So tell me what's happening with kids, because Heidi and I got into this work because Heidi is a champion of youth mm -hmm. drug abuse prevention mm -hmm. and all of the public health models we have for preventing youth access, mm -hmm. part of which is getting the source of the drug out of our communities. That's right. And so tell me what's happened in Colorado, because we're getting conflicting data about what's happening to kids in Colorado. Right. Absolutely. Let me address that conflicting data really quickly, okay. because the, the study that's most widely cited is the Healthy Kids Colorado survey, and that's something done internal to the state of right. Colorado. Right. Interestingly enough, uh, four of our largest school districts in the state did not participate in that survey. It's voluntary. And where are those districts? Uh, uh, along what we call the Front Ridge, so the Denver area. Is um, not in the survey. Is not in the survey. Jefferson County, the largest school district in the state, did not participate. My school district, which is one of the largest school districts in the state, did not participate. How do those districts wow. match up with, with where marijuana commerce is concentrated? Well, well when you have yeah. the Denver area, and it's all in with retail. Those kids have not been surveyed. Those kids are not, not surveyed. surveyed. What about Boulder? Um, I, I don't remember if Boulder is part of the survey or not, so okay. we'll have to take a look at that. Right. But um, So what we did is we don't have complete data. It relied heavily on the rural areas, and for us those are ranch communities. Right. And so it, it looks to have a drop, although it amalgamated the data. We saw clear clearly in the raw data that use amongst eighth and ninth graders was up, mm -hmm. uh, but it appears to have a drop because they amalgamated all grades together. And we are seeing a drop in juniors and seniors in high school, and, and we know that for sure. But the interesting piece of that is we're also seeing a spike in the dropout rate. And are the dropouts ki oh, kids in the Healthy Kids Survey? No. Only kids in school are in the Healthy That's Kids right. Survey. That's right, okay. That's right, so what you see is um, you have the kids who are dropping out about junior year of high school, and that's when you see the use rates go down. But if you look at the National Survey of Drug Use and Health, 
If you look at those studies monitoring the future. Which is considered the gold standard. Right. That's the gold of standard. Data. And yep. also a different um, matchup of how they measure change. Yep. We had a different measurement of change. Uh, Colorado's number one in the nation for youth use. Where were you before you began the legalization movement? I Where think did you we rank? Were like ten. 10? 10. Yeah, ten. I think and we now were you're 10. number one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, number one, which is not a first place you want to win. So, so you're saying that the monitor the future and the uh, the household survey is a better is be a better data set. Absolutely. And does not align with your Colorado Healthy Kids survey, right. which is showing a drop in the juniors and seniors. Right. So, what are you seeing an increase in the other? In those in the national survey data, yes. Okay. And, and kind of interestingly enough, is that we tried to do an open records request act on the raw data in Colorado because we wanted it to be analyzed by the experts who do monitoring the future, and that request was denied. They refused to share the methodology for mm -hmm. the survey. Absolutely. So, so there was to a, outside analysts, right? There was a group of um, interested parties in Colorado who were working in prevention. And this is frustrating because uh, um, a, an overview of that data shows some problems with it, but it's widely quoted, and so people just take it for granted. But so what we're seeing is four years ago in Denver, mm -hmm. one in four high school students said I use marijuana. Now one in three Denver high school it's students four years use ago. marijuana. Which is a 30% increase right. in yeah. the number and of kids who say they use marijuana. And it's only just I mean, we're just in the infancy stages of this unleashed industry. Right. So okay. your level of confidence around increased youth rate, mm -hmm. your level of confidence in the data is pretty high. Absolutely. Okay. I, I work with uh, a lot of folks who are in schools. My previous background before I was in drug testing was in school safety. Okay. I worked on a post-Columbine program called Safe to Tell, and we talked to kids about precursors to and violent that, behaviors. That was work after Columbine? That's yeah. right. Okay. A and uh, I'll tell you, kids were very concerned about pure drug use because that was one of the risk factors. And so I had been involved in youth drug prevention for several years. and. I not only can I not believe the increase that we're seeing, and the school resource officers I've worked with over the years are saying the, the hallways just smell like pot. Schools are backing off of zero tolerance policies. Wow. I mean, statewide, the Colorado Department of Education is saying no more zero tolerance policies. Why? Because we know suspensions and expulsions don't work for kids. Right. And what other options do we have? So now we're tolerating it. So you're going to see where you have seen exp uh, expulsions and suspensions increase. You're going to start to see those go down. But it's not because use is going down. It's because we're backing off. And then we're taking expulsions. care of those kids in our schools, right? That's we're going right. to take care. So we're going to need to increase budgets, make sure we have social right. workers in our schools to be taking care of the kids who are habituated. If they stay in school. If, if they're if allowed they to stay in school. That's right. But so the dropout rates another are it's, increasing yeah. in yeah. Colorado. We it's had another, dropped. Yeah. Yep. We had dropped our dropout rates and now that. they're back on but, the increase. So all I'm introducing, you know, as a school mm -hmm. committee member is that we have to take care of those kids. Absolutely. And this introduces a new risk and probably new illness right. in, and right. our schools have right. to take care of right. them. So this goes to revenues and taxes. Well, mm -hmm. it does. Um, mm -hmm. I also was thinking that, you know, let's let's talk about our, our law because I hear all the time, well, we should just pass this. Senator Rosenberg just came uh, out with, let's pass this and we will fix it. The mm -hmm. legislature will fix the flaws. And mm -hmm. given all the prescriptive details in this law, mm -hmm. is that is that doable? I and mean, what's been your experience in Colorado? Because it seems like you expected one thing and then you, I mean, wh what's happening? In conversations prior to our passage, we would hear all the time in these conversations, our lawmakers are smart people, they'll figure it out. What they didn't anticipate was the powerful lobbying A that would be done, and then the insistence on fair and equal representation at the regulatory table. So yours is actually written completely differently that it's mandated to have a majority of the marijuana lobby sitting at the table and those representing the industry have the majority of votes. Right. What I saw firsthand was, was um, in debates and discussions is that those representing cannabis would promise the voters, yes, those are things we'll work out, we'll figure it out. The impaired driving, we'll figure it out, we'll get that taken care of. And then go up to Denver and sit at the regulatory table and fight those very things that they promised we would fix. And it's really smart attorneys they have working for them. Absolutely. So, so, so I would, it's, and, it's not yep. in their interest as a business plan right, because to the restrict goal, anything. That's right. The goal is to make marijuana succeed in Colorado, right. not to restrict right. it, not to regulate it, right. So it's their job to, to increase it commercially right. profitable. So, so what you're talking yeah. about, and, and in this law, so that our viewers know, in our law, it prescribes that we'd have a 15-member 
advisory board. Regulatory advisory board. Regulatory board. advisory board. And nine of those members would be representatives of the industry. And, and can I tell you that top, a, a quorum, a quorum oh. of that advisory mm -hmm. group is a majority. So tell, tell us about that. So 15 members are on that mm -hmm. regulatory advisory mm -hmm. committee. But okay. if they have a meeting with a quorum, which is a majority, which is eight of eight. the 15, mm -hmm. okay. can pass a recommendation up to the... Wow. So I call that... Um, industrial regulatory capture hardwired baked in to the letter of the law mm -hmm. so and they want that commission enshrined in the Massachusetts general laws so regulation of marijuana in Massachusetts would be controlled by the marijuana industry so that's like having if we were going to try to put some regulatory pieces in place for the tobacco industry sure. the RJ tobacco Reynolds would executives do it. Are, yeah. are, are in charge of that yeah right. RJ Reynolds wow. would be writing tobacco regulation yeah. Wow. I, I really say often it's it's like the fox minding the hen house yeah. because they get the final say and it's for their benefit. It's not for the benefit of public health and safety. Now we have very limited time so I want to get to the tax base that you were talking Good. about. Okay. So in this law we would be taxed at 12 percent. Um, that's with the local and the state tax combined. So at the most, our marijuana would be taxed in Ma Massachusetts would be 12 percent. Now I know in Colorado it's very different. What is yes, the tax we have there? like double the tax rate that you do. It's at 25 percent. And the reality of it is the total tax revenue has been less than one-tenth of one percent of our entire state budget. Less than one-tenth of one percent of the state budget. And we're not calculating the cost. So let me just say that in emergency department visits alone in the last three years from people being uh, going to the emergency department for what they call um, marijuana is, poisonings or THC poisonings. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of different things that happen with that. But in those alone, um, we've seen an increase. We're highest in the nation. Those numbers on their own are in the hundreds and hundreds of thousands, several millions uh, even. Marijuana roadside fatalities, and we haven't had time to talk about that, so we'll have to do another yeah. episode, mm -hmm. but yeah. roadside fatalities alone, the increase of those is two billion dollars in cost to our state but we're not weighing that against the income right we're not matching the right. income with the cost so then who we paid for the regulatory rivaled. development who paid for the regulatory the development the, the state, state of colorado we paid had to for write the it into our general budget for the first six years because there was no seed money we mm -hmm. looked in medical marijuana and they were bankrupt mm -hmm. So we wow. have written this into our state general fund for the first six years. So we still have two years left. So the taxpayers had to pay for the regulation. Absolutely. Um, putting that infrastructure sure. in place, which is right. still and strain and still trying to fight. Absolutely. And I'm really trying to keep up with all the loopholes. That right. your Department of Agriculture has asked for a whole constellation of new positions so that they can try and get inspections in place for the product. Exactly, because we did not anticipate what would be coming with the pesticides, the herbicides, the groundwater contamination. I mean, which there is a are lot. So many a issues. lot of that is is regulated by the feds, but because it's an Ill, it's it's federally illegal, then the state has to take those right. roles on and responsibilities. Right. I come out of environmental wow. policy, so I could would, I would love to do a show right. on the environmental impacts to water, to chemistry, mm -hmm. um, and to energy deal. consumption because they're all unsustainable. Absolutely, Jody. Let me just say to you that um, many neighborhoods are putting commercial generators into the neighborhood communities to handle the power because the the um, commercial generators are what can handle the power. Because in, so indoor home grows. Outdoor right. home growing is wow. still illegal? Because our law says outdoor home growing. Technically, but okay. what is indoor? What does that mean? So folks will throw up a plastic greenhouse in their backyard so and say, well, seen. it's indoor. Yeah. Okay. So it, it's all over the map. But what I would leave your voters with is it's not what you think. Read the law before you vote on it. It's it's a bear. There's there's tons of stuff. It's but so hard to it's read. It's very complicated. And it's but, so hard to read. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been telling people to read it, but I get it's a headache reading it. You mm -hmm. can't find that that this law changes our food and safety laws, our bakery and the inspection safety laws, to redefine what a contaminant is. Right. And yes. so that THC oh can be goodness. introduced the, into the food system. Just the system. basic details of this law, and we, we need to wrap up. Mm -hmm. So ba just the basic details of the laws, where the home grows and the and the pot shops and how many there can be. Mm -hmm. There's no limit on those, and there's no right. limit on THC pro um, con content, and there's no limit on the, the edibles that we can have, and cookies, mm -hmm. gummy bears, uh, goldfish. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot to talk about, but we're going to stop here. I will tell people to go to the, um, the Massachusetts Prevention Alliance website at MA. 
Uh, Mass Prevention. Yeah, it's mapreventionalliance.org. Mapreventionalliance.org. There's a lot of information on there on just the details of the law alone. It's not complicated. It's very base. You can look there and 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 find information there. But we're happy that Joe could join Thank us you. today. We're very excited to have mm -hmm. you. We hope to hear a lot from you in the next three days mm -hmm. through your trip here. And thank you, Jody Hensley. Yes, and, and thank you for, for watching us today. And we look forward to doing this again soon. Thank you. Thanks so much.